Are you tired of the violence, nudity, vulgar language, and all other negative things on television? Well, guess what? You are not alone. Life Vision TV is a new and exciting network for the whole entire family. Get Life Vision TV on Roku, Amazon Fire Stick, Apple TV, and of course on our website, www.lifevisiontv.com, and on Apple and Android apps. Life Vision TV, already making TV better. Things God's done to me. All 
Greetings, everyone. We're really excited that you've joined us for this month's edition of the Light Vision October Experience. Our theme for this month is wealth, affluence, and holiday spending in our community. Now, this is going to be a segment that is going to hopefully revolutionize your thinking about a lot of things. I want to talk about three things today that I think will affect us. It comes from the premise here of, first of all, that in the black community in the United States of America, here we are 150 years since we were property, and now God has blessed us to have $1.6 trillion in spending power. That means the money that comes into our hands in the course of a year through wages, business, inheritances, pensions, whatever. $1.6 trillion. That amount of money, if we were a, a country, we would be 15th wealthiest country in, on the face of the earth. $1.6 trillion. Now, unfortunately, on the flip side of that, it's something we call wealth. Wealth is the money that you get in and you subtract from that and add up all your assets, your, your income, your furniture, uh, your, your house, uh, stocks, bonds, all that kind of stuff. But then you have to subtract from that what you owe out, the mortgage that you have, the car payment, all of that kind of stuff. And what you're left with is your net worth or your wealth. Now, unfortunately for us, that 1.6 trillion, which is astounding amount of, of money coming into our hands, when you take out what we owe, our debt, our net worth is among the smallest, it's actually declined. When we you know, climb to 1.6, our net worth has declined um, to the point where we are next to the last of all ethnic groups in the United States. I think Native Americans are the only people that are under us um, in that uh, list of uh, net worth wealth. And we gotta think about what do we do to change this? And that's the theme of what we want to address this month. I'm gonna talk about three C's, three C's. The first is cable TV, second is cars, and the third is conventions. I got it, cable TV, cars, conventions. And you say, what does that have to do with wealth? Well, part of our dilemma is what we do with the money that we have. It comes into our hands, but then it goes out. And when it comes to African Americans, our money only stays in our hands for a very brief time. Some of the things we've got to think about is how do we cut that off in terms of what we spend, what we spend it on. So I want to start with cable TV because it's the, the thing that actually I gravitated to as a first point of, of grappling with our wealth, cable TV. I haven't been involved with, uh, with, with cable um, as the vice president of Baltimore Cable Access Corporation in Baltimore. And um, and so when we moved here, we started uh, our uh, network as a means of focusing our attention on what we spend on TV. We happen to be people that love TV more than any other ethnic group. We watch a lot of it. And uh, when cable came along, we have embraced it. We hold on to it. Only other groups have uh, dropped cable, cut the cord, moved away from cable over the last 10, uh, 10, 10 years or so. Um, to the point where Comcast, who was the biggest cable company in the United States, had about 100 million subscribers when we first started Life Vision uh, 10 years ago. Now that number has dropped to about 25 million, 25 million from 100 million. What has taken its place is streaming using Roku, uh, 
Amazon Fire TV and other boxes, Apple TV and so forth. People get their, uh, what they watched on cable, the channels that they watched before, the cable they now watch through the internet. I just want to share this quick thing with you to think about. We were in a community in Orlando called Pine Hills. It has about 20,000 families in Pine Hills. The average cable bill in this country is $180 a month. $180 a month. If you cut cable and go to streaming using the Roku box or Amazon Fire TV box or something like that, you would catch your bill to an average of $80 a month. So you save $100 a month. That's, that's a nice saving. Over a period of a year, it's, it's $1,200. Pretty much the equivalent of one of those stimulus checks that we got during the pandemic. But here's where it becomes really important. If there are 20,000 families in that community of Pine Hills, it's an African-American community in north uh, west of in, in Orlando, 20,000 families. If each of those cut the cable, saved $100, that comes to $2 million a month just in Pine Hills. $2 million a month got freed up in Pine Hills. That's $24 million over the course of a year. $24 million in one African-American community. That's just the west side. If you did it on the east side, you could double that, maybe $50 million a year right in Pine Hills. Take that for 10 major cities around the country that are led by African-Americans, and you're talking about $500 million, half a billion dollars saved in just one community by cutting the cable. I want you to see that that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. Freeing up money in our own community without a government grant, without lobbying City Hall or the government. It's in our control. Well, Saints, we've talked first about cable TV and the amount of money that can be released to go towards our wealth by simply switching from cable to streaming uh, through using Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, so forth. Now I wanna talk about the second C, cars, cable TV, and now cars. Yes, cars. You know, we are stylish people, and no matter where we are on the spectrum of our credit, uh, we want to look the best, and we want to drive a nice car. And a lot of our ideas about what is a nice car comes from uh, what we see out on the road, but we also impacted by uh, advertising, TV advertising for cars. And we're also influenced by those who are around us. I'll give you an example, when my kids were growing up, they were part of the generation that grew up on VH1, uh, MTV, BET, hip hop stars, rappers, uh, filming music videos with pretty girls and fancy cars. Roses, Bentleys, Maybachs, Mercedes, Range Rovers. That's the kind of thing that, that they looked at as that was, uh, that, that was hip. That was what uh, we ought to aspire to. Our young athletes, young men coming out of college at 22, 23 years old, they were buying these kinds of cars and Ferraris and Lamborghinis and all of that sort of thing. And then not only were we uh, influenced by what entertainers, athletes were doing, we were also in, uh, uh, influenced by the church world. Uh, there were guys with mega churches, thousands of members, um, big uh, buildings that they were in but also driving Bentleys, Rolls Royces, Mercedes Benz, and if you really got big, you'd have your own plane. So all these things influence the choices that we think are the things that we ought to aspire to. Now, when we consider our assets and liabilities and our wealth and net worth, of course the cars go on the asset side, they're an asset, 
uh, depending on what you, you pay for them, how you pay for it. Um, the, not only are they an asset, but they also, if we had to finance it, it's also in the liabilities column. Uh, so when you should, you know, you take what it's worth, subtract what you owe, that's the net worth for that particular uh, investment. And, and you add up all of those assets and all those liabilities and you wind up with a net worth. So we have a situation where uh, many, many people, you know, in America, you know, we even amongst the black folks with a high unemployment rate, five or six percent, that means that 95, 94 percent of us have a job. We have income. We can qualify for some kind of car. Um, and we got to think about this, this, uh, this equation as it affects our wealth. It's a very important thing to, to, to consider because as wonderful as the car is and, and, and you know, the, the pressure, internal pressure to, to, you know, not look like you're driving something that's not uh, what the rest of the people in your group are driving. Uh, you don't want to come to church in a in a beat up car, and and everybody else is driving luxury cars. Um, but cars are a depreciating asset. That means when you drive off the lot, the car starts losing money. Other investments that you have, they grow every day. The car loses value every day. It becomes a, a less and less valuable every passing day. Um, and this is a problem for us um, because if we have, if, if you have millions of black folks who have a lot of their income invested in a depreciating asset, that means each day they're going down. And listen, my friend, cars have become very, very expensive today. Very, very expensive. I mean, to get a, a normal car like a Ford or a, a Chevrolet, a, a new one, an SUV, you, you might be paying thirty-five, forty thousand uh, dollars for for a, a car like this. But for a luxury car like a Mercedes or an Audi or a, a Range Rover, you, you may be paying 60, 70, 80,000, even $100,000 uh, for, for that car. That's going down in value. And some of them go down in value quickly. And a lot of luxury cars lose their value very, very quickly. So first of all, it's probably not the best idea to buy a brand new one that is gonna take a big depreciation hit uh, in the first few years that you have it. So I might consider uh, buying something that's a couple of years old uh, and uh, with you know low mileage um, and let somebody else take the, 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 the big depreciation hit. But listen, when you start to put this into real terms and you start looking at our, our population, of African Americans in the United States. Imagine if, and I want to speak particularly to church leaders, because we're dealing with people who are saved and who don't waste all their money, you know, drinking and drugs and partying. Um, they're frugal in those respects. But if they aspire to be like you and you have a luxury car, they don't want to you know, misrepresent the church and your ministry. So they are gonna to strive to do the same kind of thing. We need a generation of leaders to come up now that a move away from this old notion that as a pastor of a black church, no matter whether it's a storefront or a church with a hundred members or two hundred members or five hundred members, that they must drive a luxury vehicle and set the tone for people's visions of what success is. If they all started buying a $35,000 car um, with you know a few thousand miles on it and saved $40,000, instead of spending 80,000, they spent 40,000 for a car. $40,000 now freed up 
in the community. Suppose you got 50,000 people around the country who took that plunge and decided, I, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to get one of those uh, European or German luxury cars or British luxury cars. I'm going to get something that costs 35 or $40,000. The, the, the most up-to-date uh, stuff in it, uh, tech stuff in it. Uh, it runs on regular gasoline. Um, it's not it's nearly as expensive to maintain as the luxury car. Gets 20 uh, or more miles per gallon uh, when you go to fill it, uh, when you're driving it. The 50,000 people around the country, you know, a, a, a few in every major city did this and, and saved $40,000. That's $200 million. Two, if if 50,000 people moved down from spending $80,000 on a depreciating asset to $40,000, to, to, to $40, $200 million now freed up for our people to use for uh, investing in things that appreciate in value. Can you imagine what we can do if we just change our focus of what we think makes us successful? I can guarantee you, if you go to some, some very large churches of uh, white folks, but not, not necessarily the, uh, you know, the, the prosperity preachers, uh, you're not gonna see the pastor with, with one of those luxury cars. Um, you just drive past this, the, the parking lot and look at the, the spaces where it says reserved for pastor. Check that against one of our pastors in a storefront that holds 50 people. You're liable to see the Mercedes there and not on the big, uh, the big white campus. Listen, my friends, we got to do something about our bottom line, our net worth, cars is a good place to start. All right, friends, we've talked about two of the three C's that I want to address in building the net worth of our community. We chose cable TV as one to start with the first C. Second C, cars. Third C I want to tackle is conventions. Conventions, that's right. Now, I don't want, I'm going to say this ahead of time so that you don't get mad at me. I'm, I have been in church organizations. I've been in uh, civil, social service organizations all of my life. I was the convention coordinator for our denomination, International Bible Way. I'm on the ex executive board of bishops, so we make decisions about the conventions and all of our meetings. But I want to show us that... If we are serious about keeping money in our community, not having it flow out of our hands, it's directly into the hands of people um, who are going to use our money to, to do all kinds of stuff. Um, they're glad to get it. Hotels are glad to get it, airlines, rental car companies, restaurants. Everything that's associated with traveling to a convention and participating are things that, that when we begin to examine the amount of money that we invest in these things, it is a, an outflow from the black community to the larger community, and it's mind-boggling the amounts. What are you saying, Pastor? Let's think about this. It was a large convention of one of our major Pentecostal organizations in Baltimore a number of years ago when I was still living there. And there was an article in the Sun paper about the economic impact of this group coming to Baltimore um, to have their uh, convention. It wasn't their main convention. Uh, it, it, it was a convention of the auxiliaries. Um, it was going to have $30 million in economic impact. $30 million. Now, that's not talking about what happened inside of the organization and the offerings that they took up, you know, for the things that
that if we needed to run the organization. This is the impact of the hotel's fees, the rooms, the, the meals, the banquets, um, the uh, rental cars, uh, you know, everything of uh, sightseeing, all of this stuff uh, where people were excited when the convention bureau told them this group is gonna be coming on these dates Get ready because you're going to get an infusion of money uh, that is going to be significant for you. That's one organization, $30 million within the course of a week. Now, if you do this exercise to all of the church groups, just let's take the church groups first of all. So you're talking about the AMEs, you, you're talking about the AME Zions, you're talking about the National Baptist, Progressive Baptist, Missionary Baptist, <laughs> Church of God in Christ, Pentecostal Assembly of the World, Cool JC, International Bible Way. You can just go on and on and on. There are organizations that I can't even think of right at, right at this moment. And when you begin to add up the impact of just the church groups um, coming to hotels and signing a contract uh, to, to uh, guarantee that there are gonna be a certain number of room nights um, and that there's gonna be a certain amount of food and beverage that you're gonna contract from them, it comes out to hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Because we do these meetings, most of us have two or three meetings a year. Some of the smaller ones and then the big ones. It's a lot of money. Now, this doesn't include just the church groups because we have the divine nines, fraternities, sororities. We have social uh, organizations, the NAACP, the Urban League, all kinds of other groups that are meeting all over this country all year long. We call the hotels and say, hey, we want to come to your hotel. Uh, how much will you let us come for? And uh, they are glad to receive our money. Excited about it. <laughs> and the pandemic, they lost so much money that coming out of it, uh, they're going to help themselves to whatever money you have to make up for what they lost during during that time. My friend, I've, I've done studies. Uh, I invite you to do it. Just, just start thinking about how much money you spend in your organization um, to uh, bring people together and then envision it as if from all of these uh, churches, and not only the churches, because it comes from the people who are in the churches, we are taking our paychecks, we're taking our hard-earned dollars, and we're bringing it deposited in, in the Marriott and, um, <laughs> and, and all, you know, all of these other hotels, they are having a ball. The airlines are happy, the rental car companies, are happy, the restaurants in the area, everybody is going away with our money. We got to go back and raise some more money to come back again uh, a, a few months later. We need to think about how we operated even in the pandemic. When we couldn't come together, um, we started using Zoom to have our board meetings and, and, and learn how to innovate and have putting on services and revivals even and workshops online. Many organizations found themselves in the black in a way that they hadn't before because they didn't have all the expenses that came with coming together. Sure, we need to come together. Maybe we come, we just cut down the number of meetings that we have, but we need to look at holding these hundreds of million dollars that we are just dispensing freely and having a good time and saying, wasn't it good for us to have come together? Amen. The three C's, cable TV, our cars, and our conventions. God bless you.